All right, everybody, welcome to the latest episode of The Sherman Show. I'm Jeff Sherman, along with my co-host, Sam Lau. Hey, hey. And today we have a very special guest, something we don't do very often, bringing a competition into the studio. So today we're joined by none other than Stephen Rocco. He is the co-head of Taxable Fixed Income and responsible for the oversight of all of Lord Abbott's Taxable Fixed Income. So welcome to The Sherman Show, Stephen. Thanks, Jeff and Sam, for having me. All right. And so uh, I know that Sam wanted to get into the trade secrets. You're going to teach us that, but maybe we don't share it with all of our uh, listeners. You can share it with us after the fact. But before, why don't you take us on a progress about your career? You used to work in investment grade. Now you oversee kind of the high yield, multi-sector, uh, graduating to all things fixed income. Why don't you take us on a little tour of the life of Stephen Rocco? Great. So I graduated from Cornell in, in 2001. That was at the... Uh, kind of tail end of the, uh, the tech wreck. And I started at a uh, financial software company I think everyone should be familiar with called FactSet. Great company. Uh, it's been around a long time, a competitor to Bloomberg. The original great, FinTech, right? And one of the original FinTechs, yes. Yeah. And it's just a fantastic place and a great culture. And that's how I got to know Lord Abbott. I was a consultant at FactSet. Uh, we supported many buy-side clients like Lord Abbott. I visited Lord Abbott's offices and the job opened up in 2004 to be a treasury and agency associate portfolio manager. And that was the most junior role, I would say, uh, at Lord Abbott in investing at the time, where you kind of learn the ropes in fixed income. I knew nothing about fixed income, but I had a passion for investing. And that goes way back to when I was managing my own money when I was 12 years old. That's when I first started. Uh, and my uh, parents were nice enough to, to get me started there. And I also uh, spent time working in the library in Scarsdale in New York, where I grew up and, and earned some money to invest. And uh, I you know, carried that forward, but I knew nothing about fixed income. And uh, so starting at Lord Abbott was a, was a huge kind of experience for me. Um, and, and so just being interested in the markets like I am, I took all the people who were around me and all the information that was kind of given to me and just ran with it. Um, and so I learned a lot about treasuries and about agencies, and I moved on to investment grade corporates in about 2007. And then in 2010, so there I managed through the, uh, the financial crisis, both as an IG uh, portfolio manager and a high yield portfolio manager. And I spent a lot of time with Chris Toll, who's now retired, who, ran our, who uh, used to run our bond adventure fund, which I currently lead manage. And that fund's been around for 50 years. And I helped him and his uh, uh, other portfolio manager, Michael Goldstein, uh, through the financial crisis, specifically on the investment grade side. As you remember, there's a lot of investment grade opportunities, a lot of opportunities everywhere, but certainly investment grade, remember buying Pepsi with a 9% coupon, you know, things like that in, in, uh, in, uh, during the financial crisis. And so when, when uh, Michael left the firm, Chris wanted me to manage the uh, high yield fund. So I became the lead manager of the high yield fund in uh, 2010. So I've been doing it for about 11 years now. It's my year track record. And then when Chris retired in 2014, I took over... Um, the leverage credit business and our multi-sector franchise bond adventure. And then in 2017, I became the, um, the uh, director of taxable fixed income, which I now co-head with Robert Lee. That's right. kind of my quick Lord Abbott story. Yeah. I mean, um, it's definitely a, a story of moving up through the ranks, right? Starting from, you know, a data analyst, you know, to getting that first role of touching money, you know, the more conservative product and, and really extending out. So, um, what do you see different in your career today versus when you started off? Is it more the autonomy? Is it having that flexibility? And as someone who really works on multi-sector fixed income, you know, how do you incorporate all the different views of various sectors of the market? So that's a good question. Um, I would say I certainly Lord Abbott gives people like me um, a lot of autonomy, right? But also gave me a lot of autonomy very early in our career. I think that's something we're very proud of that we uh, that hopefully we hire well, we give people a chance to, to succeed and, and a chance to make mistakes, right? Which is important as in this business, we're all gonna make mistakes. So um, I had autonomy at, a, at a, I think a very, very young age, maybe arguably too young um, in my career, but it kind of worked out, it kind of worked out for us. I would say when I first started, I was uh, very narrowly focused on, on investment grade corporates. And I learned a lot about investment grade corporates. I was trading investment grade corporates. I was doing our own, my own research in investment grade corporates. And I just grew. Um, and I always had that kind of intellectual curiosity to, to want to understand other markets like muni bonds. We did a lot around Build America bonds. That was kind of my next step out of investment grade corporates. And then into, into high yield during the, during the financial crisis. So just having that intellectual curiosity, which I think both of you know is extremely important to have in this business and, and never lose it, really never lose it. 
Um, and I think that that you know now managed in many many different asset classes. So we see we see the whole fields. But now versus kind of where I was like ten years ago, I'm operating more at the the kind of the top level, the macro level. Um, we have a great great team here that does a lot of security selection. You mentioned kind of the, the secret sauce. Like we've had great analysts here for for decades. You know before I started, um, and they do a lot of security selection. I don't really get in the way of that. And we have great portfolio managers that know their sectors and. I can just kind of pick and choose, but really I think where I can make the most impact right now versus 10 to 15 years ago is on the macro side. All right, so macro is Sam's forte. So let's get into the landscape today. So thematically, what are the big things you're watching? We've seen a, a big move in, in yields in the last four weeks, a big meal, big move, 35 basis points, but that's what gets us Bondos excited, right? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, we've seen a big move there. There seems to be some kind of shifting of the of the financial narrative. So thematically, what are you seeing right now on the macro front and front? And what are kind of some of the concerns and what are some of the opportunities? So feel free to run with that. Sure. I hope I don't ramble too much, but okay. I'd say, you know, what's interesting about, about the macro um, is in many ways we're early cycle with kind of late cycle valuations. I think that's make, makes it tricky. You know, no, I think none of us have experienced a pandemic during, during our careers and how to manage through one. Um, and we're all kind of, kind of learning how, how to do that. And so if you, if you talk to me in the first part of the year, it was very much about kind of reflation, right? And, and those inflationary types of exposures. It wasn't so much true in, in, in kind of nominal rates, right? But it was certainly true in the equity market. Um, and you had a lift off, obviously, in, in nominal rates, small move, but certainly steeper curves. Um, and then as we move through, um, you know, kind of the spring and summer, we had to deal with Delta, which was a surprise to the market. Um, and, you know, we at Lord Abbott, you know, protected ourselves with a little bit of interest rate hedges um, to get through that period. And now I think we're back to where we started in Q1, actually. Um, and that's kind of playing through now. And, you know, this word transitory that everyone talks about, we never believe that. Uh, we believe inflation is trending. I mean, I remember when we did our our, our kind of, um, I, I don't know what that was called exactly. It was an advisor perspectives call. I think we were talking to financial advisors. We talked about, um, you know, kind of the the outlook for wages and, and you know, owner equivalent rent. We're starting to see that kind of tick up a little bit, right? Which is how inflation trends. And certainly the supply chain challenges, I think, have been longer lasting than the, than the market has has. Um, has uh, expected, right? And that's kind of what's being being priced in now. Those eventually will go away, right? I, and I think sooner, you know, sooner than people expect. I was looking at a Wall Street Journal poll today that uh, I think most economists expect the supply chain challenges to be with us through Q2. But I think a lot of that's discounted in the market right now, if I was being frank. Um, but I don't think what is, is kind of rising wages and, and OER. And I think those are more trending in, in series, right? And so that's yeah, something to find kind of, OER for our listeners. We know what it is, but just so our listeners know. Yeah, we're talking about, you know, owner, owner's, owner's equivalent rent. Um, that, that's a big part of, um, of, of the CPI. Um, that's really how you're measuring housing costs um, as part of the CPI. And clearly we're in a bull market in housing. Um, so for us, you know, kind of long story short, we believe we're in a bull market, right? But really the composition is, is kind of been the trick this year, right? And how to navigate that. And there's certainly ways to navigate it in interest rate markets. There's ways to navigate it in credit. In credit specifically, um, you know, we were very much focused uh, coming out of the summer on, <clears throat> on a, again, another reopening type of trade, uh, which I think has played out nicely. Uh, we talk about the letter C here, you know, keep it simple. My three-year-old letter C, Sesame Street, <laughs> you know, letter C, it's everything but China. It's commodities, it's CRE, it's CLOs, you know, bank loans, those flowing rate exposures, not a letter C, but obviously plays into CLOs. Um, and, and those covenant are light. Kind of, I'll give you a covenant light. Yeah, you got covenant, bank loan covenant, market, right? Yeah. You know, covenant light. You can even talk about container ships and cruises. It kind of plays very well at letter C. China's been the kind of the one bear market this year, which doesn't doesn't work for the letter C, but um, that's been our that's been our focus here, and that's kind of playing out right now, right? And we'll see if there's a, a limit to that as oil prices keep rising. Um, and certainly that has, that has impacts. And then globally, you can, you can see, you know, what's happened in the UK, which I think has effects on our markets and is flattening our curve here as well. And so uh, we're very much positioned for kind of re a reflationary, uh, you know, type of environment. And I think what's happened recently here with the two year is kind of the market kept catching up, right, and to what the Fed may need to do next year. And I think it's reasonable in my mind that the market would price in two hikes. I don't think that's unreasonable. Will the market go beyond that? I don't think so. That's why I hope I don't think like I don't think rates are going to get completely at the anchor and out of hand. If so, I don't think we're going to be in a bull market. I'm not sure how much higher rates the market can take, but um, that ebb and flow between you know on the on the bond side between you know cyclicality and defensive, 
between triple C's and double B's and the equity side between value and growth, right? We're seeing a lot of that kind of factor rotation. That's kind of been the name of the game for us this year. Yeah, so I, I, I concur with that. We've been kind of uh, interested in watching the front of the curve, even, even the belly of the curve, you know, just the movement we've seen, you know, like I said, it was 35 basis points, which doesn't seem like a lot, but you start to look at the pricing of hikes and, and now we're to roughly two hikes priced in by the end of next year. I remind our listeners too, that the bond market tends to be a little bit ahead of the Fed, right? In terms of that pricing dynamic. So we'll, we'll have to get out of tapering first, I like to say, but as you think about that, what does this portend for interest rates at this level, right? You, you know, you talked about uh, early cycle, but, but late cycle kind of valuations. But what we see here too, is a lot of it's been priced off the interest rate component, right? And yep. so we're seeing some of that repricing with the twos and fives on their way upward. Um, what does that say to you about where rates should be, you know, given the behavior of the Fed and likely less purchases over the next, let's call it eight to nine months? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult question. As you know, forecasting interest yeah. rates is extremely difficult. Um, and we, we tend not to do a lot of it here, actually, which maybe has helped us over the years, um, you know, I would say. But just I'll give you, you know, kind of my opinion, which isn't exactly, we shouldn't consider it a house view. Um, but I think, you know, third quarter, I think it's priced in that it's going to be, you know, the slowest quarter of the year, right? And and we had dealt with the blame for that. But I think the market here is, you know, very sensitive to, kind of signs of improving growth, right? And you saw how the market reacted on Friday when you got stronger retail sales, right? And and I think you'll see as Delta, hopefully Delta is dying, right? You see the case counts dropping, you know, across the globe that that'll unleash kind of, you know, more more spending and, and stronger growth in Q4, which suggests to me that you would have a, ste- a you know, a steeper curve. I think well, right now, I think that's kind of TBD, right? And so, you know, you have worries about stagflation, which I think is overblown, right? You still have strong growth um, and certainly higher inflation. I think you'll get to a period where growth is, is stronger and inflation is a little bit higher. That's not necessarily a bad thing, right? That's, that's you know, there could be a bull market with strong growth and a little bit of inflation, which suggests rates should be a little bit higher. But um, I think, you know, right now you'd have to see a point where um, you actually get that kind of growth. You know, that's my view. It may not happen. And if it doesn't happen, that's a flatter curve, right? Because the market will just price in that inflation is trending and the Fed is going to have to move and they will move um, if we kind of you know, are moving into next year with this this level of inflation that we're running at right now. But I think the key for to keep this bull market going, keep the rates rate, rate market a little bit elevated will be that growth component. And that's what we expect. Um, absent another variant or some shock, I think I think it's reasonable to expect that. Yeah. And I, I mean, we, we've been in the same camp, too. And it's very it's very difficult right now because rates just seem way too low, given what, you know, the outlook, as you say, for nominal growth in this country, you know, at least above trend growth that we saw, you know, post GFC, right, the global financial crisis. You know, we ran about two point four percent annualized real. Um, we had inflation that hovered, you know, call it call it to let's be nice to just call it roughly two. And now we're talking about a growth rate next year that potentially could look like in the high threes to low fours real slap on, you know, a three to 4% inflation rate. And all of a sudden, you know, you're back to that old school nominal growth of 7%. Now, that doesn't mean old school rates have to apply where the 10 year should be five or 6%. But, you know, what do you make of this 160 tenure at this point? Is it, is, is it the fear of the deflation? Is it the Delta variant that, you know, overcame everything? Is it too heavy a footprint from central banks? Um, what do you make of, of kind of that disconnect of where kind of the old school analysis would lead on rates to where we are today? Yeah, I think you hit on one. I mean, I think, well, I think European rates matter, right, for our market. Yep. Um, and I'm not sure I would, I'm ready to proclaim that European inflation is trending, right? I think there are a lot of base effects there, obviously, that, and it'll be, you know, given the kind of the demographic and the secular there, I think that may be a challenge, which maybe holds our rate market back. Well, and remember um, that their inflation rate when it was strong was like one previously, right. not even two. It was half the rate they were looking at. So I, I, I appreciate some of that skepticism. Yeah, so there's that. And then I think, you know, you, you touched on um, central banks, right? I think it matters, right? The, the stock effect matters. And I think maybe when you start to unwind, you see term premium kind of move in a different direction. That's certainly a possibility. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, I believe that. I don't know where you, where you come down in this, Jeff, but um, I don't think the market can handle you know, higher rates. I think it collapses on itself in some way. 
maybe that's naive to think that at this point, but because you said like these have been very, very small moves, but you observe it day to day. It feels like if, if the tenure, you know, and I guess the speed matters too, but and if growth is strong and inflation is a little bit hot, okay, and the yield, yield, you know, kind of yield curve moves up a little bit, fine, but kind of a shock upward it, to me is like, you know, a, a recipe for a big correction and a, a, and a reason to go the other way. Yeah, like 50, so. 50, 60 bips in a month typically is something that kind of gets gets the other markets to wake up and listen to what the race yeah. market's saying. But 25, 30 here and there, you know, it, it can do it measured and just see the first quarter, right? We kind of hit that inflection point at a 175 yeah. tenure, right? It was exactly. And then we're talking about different markets too, right? Like what, what credit wants, right? Strong growth, a little bit of inflation is great for credit, right? And right. I think that's why credit, credit hasn't moved this year, right? It's been tighter, but it hasn't really moved, hasn't had the volatility. Clearly, you know, you have the S&P 500 with a lot of tech stocks that have high multiples and, you know, your price off a negative real rate, like that moves a little bit, it's going to matter, right? It's going to matter. And so you can get a, a scenario where, you know, you get a 5% or 10% drawdown in the S&P and credit is only 10 basis points wider. That makes sense. That's what happened. That, that's what happened this summer, right? Yeah. Or more recently where you hadn't had the credit volatility because if you have strong growth with inflation, that's good for spread, in my opinion. Yeah, I guess the only downside is that we've seen kind of this front end of the curve to the fives, like twos to fives. I keep focusing on that because a lot of credit's priced in that in that realm, right? It's yep. not as long duration. And so specifically when you talk about things like high yield. So yeah, prices are down a little bit, but sp spreads have hung in there. But it's that rate component that's starting to really seep into kind of this front to belly type of trades in the corporate credit market. That's true. And that's a good point because if you look at high yield now, right, we have a lot more double Bs, you have a lot more duration, right? You have a lot more negative convexity. And so, you, you, you know, if you get a little bit of backup or a taper tantrum, person, you, you may get that kind of reaction, right? It won't be pleasant. And, you know, the, the exit doors are very small in credit, right? So it doesn't take much, you know, to to you know, widen spreads fifty to one hundred basis points. Um, it's one of the reasons why we like you know floating rate exposure right now versus high yield. So CRE and CLO, the CRE we're buying is floating rate CLOs and bank loans and such. Yeah, I mean you Which definitely is, have to keep your eyes on the the exit signs and be aware of where they're at, where they are. It just reminds me back in was it 2014, 2015, where we said it was still okay to dance you know the credit dance, but you just have to make sure you have a hand on that uh, exit door. You know, get ready to. To move out before the herd follows, right? So, or before the herd uh, front runs you, I should say. So, and, you know, as we're talking about repricing, you know, across the treasury curve and perhaps some some areas of credit, a lot of this has been predicated the strength in the economy as well has been predicated on the accommodative monetary policy. Which, you know, granted, once we begin tapering, it's still somewhat accommodative because you're still purchasing assets, but at some mm -hmm. point, you know, let's call it the second half of next year, or you know, maybe into the, the first half of 2023, we're gonna start embarking on a, a um, tighter monetary policy. On top of that, it seems like uh, politically, they're, you know, the current administration is having a little bit more difficulty getting some of what you know, market participants early on had, had anticipated to be easy accommodative fiscal stimulus as well. And that seems to be you know, getting a little bit more difficult to foresee. So a lot of that was, underpinning some of the strength that you've been talking about today. What happens now as we start thinking forward the next you know, six months, the next 12 months, and some of these things become tighter and tighter in terms of monetary and fiscal policy? Yeah, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a great question. Um, I'll, say, I'll say a couple of things. Um, if you remember back like fourth quarter of 18, right, where the Fed started hiking, um, that in retrospect was a, was a mistake, right? Because, you know, we weren't growing at the level we were growing at now, right? Um, and uh, the Fed quickly kind of reversed course. Um, so I think, you know, going back to what I said before, if we're wrong here, we're wrong on kind of growth kind of bouncing back, right? This excess savings being spent. Um, and we could be wrong on fiscal too, right? I think, you know, the way I see it right now, you have Democrats negotiating with Democrats and a midterm election. So I think you will get not the three and a half trillion that the market maybe never was expecting or was expecting, but maybe more like two trillion and over 10 years, it's not, you know, over 10 years, it's, it's big, but it's not super, you know, it's not kind of super big, but that may accelerate, um, you know, some of these things we're talking about. I think the Fed will go really slow. I think tapering obviously is something that's very well telegraphed. Um, and I think there will be a Fed put in the end if something, if there's a slippage, um, not something that I, comforts me um, being long, being long risk. Um, but I think it is a reason not to be at max kind of kind of risk levels, right? Because we are moving through this period where we have kind of uncharted kind of 
kind of maybe macro volatility, right? We haven't had inflation this high in, in quite some time. We have a Fed tapering. We have a Fed maybe hiking. We have, unco- you know, lack of clarity on, on, on fiscal. We have a wall of worry certainly to clear here. Um, but it may be a reason to, to not being at your max kind of risk level, which we're not, right? And I wouldn't advise it because if even if we're right in the cycle, that's early cycle now in, 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 in a sense, right? Coming out of a pandemic, which is strange to say, we still have these really tight valuations. Um, and it's much easier for, you know, shops like ours to invest, I think, when spreads are wider, um, you know, versus kind of sitting here because these markets can last for a long time, right? And, and, and that's the challenge, right? And, and so we've been doing things a lot in, underneath the surface and it's okay to be a little, have a little less risk to accommodate, you know, some of these kind of risk factors that, that you mentioned. I think it's reasonable. Yeah, it's- it's the old adage that that traders use, right? That you know the 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 credit markets you usually take the escalator up and the elevator down, right? So exactly, you, know, you grind in tighter and tighter and spreads very slowly, and then all of a sudden there's something exogenous or some shock that just spikes and widens those out. So talk to me about your interaction with clients today. Uh, the thing we get from folks is, well, why do I own this fixed income thing? Right. Um, that, that's usually the formal way of them asking is, you know, <laughs> w- w- why does an investor want to own fixed income when you talk about this environment where potentially there's the inflation that tends to be more trending and more persistent than perhaps the folks have been thinking about for the last six months? Uh, there could be a repricing of rates, which leads to a repricing mm-hmm. of credit. Uh, what, what's the role of fixed income today in your clients' portfolios? That's a, yeah. So, you know, I'd say, listen, the future is uncertain, right? I don't know how many deaths of like 60, 40 portfolio to death of 60, 40, 60, 40 portfolio they've read about here in the last couple of months or years. Right. Um, and, and fixed income has been a great diversifier. And, um, and I think that will continue um, even at, even at kind of levels where we're at now. I'll just take it from, you know, our business, which is more centered around, you know, leverage credit and, mul- and multi-sector. Um, where I get kind of less of, you know, I get spreads are tight, right? And this is not an opportunity to invest. And I, and I fully understand, but I always ask kind of what, what's your alternative, right? What's the alternative to what you're doing in credit? Are you buying stocks for the bull market? Because that, that's been good, right? Are you putting it in cash and where are you, what are you getting on your cash, right? And so um, I'm not saying our clients are jumping up and down to buy, to buy high yields. What they do like is giving their manager a little bit of flexibility. They like our multi-sector product. They like you know, kind of that mix of, of high yield and a little bit more defensive exposure with a little bit of equities that kind of gives them like a high yield light type of type of exposure, um, which is like a little bit of a, of a chicken way to play high yield. That's been something that's been resonating with our clients, I would say. But I can't say like everyone's jumping up and down here, right? Although I will say that we, you know, during the middle of the pandemic, we, we had a lot of support from our clients and a lot of people who were on the sidelines came in, which is really nice to see. And I think that's why we constantly all talk to our clients to you know kind of give them that perspective and so they're ready for those those moments because what we've seen is these moments i think you asked me kind of beginning of my career to now like what's happened besides the liquidity environment that's changed completely like these moments seem to be very very there's i'll use the word transitory again very very fleeting or transitory in time right like it goes away very very quickly right and look at a high yield investor investing in energy right which is basically i spent a lot of my time on that because it's a big part of my index you got to get it right you look at 14 to 15, the kind of in 2014 to 2015, the kind of swing there, you had to be nimble there. And then you had, you know, challenges in 18 and then you have energy leading today. Um, but there, the, but the spread changes have been very rapid, right? And, and same is true coming at, you know, the pandemic where you had great opportunities in retrospect, right? April, May, March, of, late March of 2020. And then it, it kind of quickly went away, right? So you always want to be prepared for those environments. And again, I go back to what I said before is just, you know, can keep your powder dry and then, you know, get ready to invest. And, and there's a lot of liquidity, right? We know that, right? This is, I think, kind of the, one of the best liquidity environments I've ever invested in. So it amazes me every day when I see it, right? The amount of money that's on the sidelines willing to be deployed here in many different things. Yeah. You, you brought up energy, and I, I think it's a very important topic for investors today because energy has been this perpetual drag on the high yield sector specifically, right? You know, over levered, over indebted, a lot of M&A at the wrong time, poorly ran in some instances. And, you know, the, the idea was that there'd be some consolidation, but we've seen actually energy really help the high yield indices tighten in massively because there's been a big improvement there. But the equity side of the equation doesn't seem to really catch the bid, right? Yes, it's done well this year. Um, it's it's really off the levels. You know, last time we had 80 plus dollar uh, oil you know, the stocks were like, you know, uh, like double where they are today. 
So how are you thinking about investing in, in the energy complex today, knowing that there's the challenges with the ESGs and the like, you know, with investors and thinking about the long-term yeah. viability <clears throat> asset? Sure. So uh, uh, there's a couple of different kind of parts to that. Um, I would say high yield hasn't fully bought in either, right? It's still the most volatile sector. It's still kind of the first thing people sell when there's trouble. Um, and you still have a spread that you're earning over the index. And if you go back to kind of pre-shale revolution, this, is an, this was a sector that traded tight to the index. I'm not saying that's my base case, but there's certainly a discount. It could be any number of things. Um, it could be its history, right? The bad experiences that a lot of high yield investors had with it. It could be an ESG component. That's certainly true. I would say, um, you know, from, from our perspective sitting here right now, um, yeah, obviously got to get the commodity, right? And we just talk about oil, right? Um, and the reopening kind of dynamics there and, and the kind of the green transition, which is something that um, is important to us. I'm like, these are very important things, but it's a long transition, right? It's a very long transition. I'm not going to blame that for the spike in oil. Um, it may be one component, <laughs> but I think the major component is just the world is reopening, right? And there's, and, and OPEC is, you know, holding back, right? And you know, getting back to high yield, what we've seen, and, I, and this is the big question of how long it lasts, is, you know, the the average high yield shale company has been very restrained in in in, uh, in this environment, right? Whereas if oil was at eighty or ninety dollars, you know, you know, four or five years ago, they would be you know pumping and pumping and pumping and drilling and drilling and drilling, right? And that hasn't happened, right? You look at rig counts; rig counts have moved up modestly, but not nowhere near where you would expect, kind of given the price environment. Um, I, I wouldn't bet the farm on that. I mean, these are still smaller companies. You mentioned there hasn't been a lot of consolidation. It's been a little bit recently. Um, I think companies will respond to that incentive. But right now, the market, what the market has rewarded has been the free cash flow generation, right? You know, and that's something, you know, when you look at tech stocks or oil stocks, the one thing is they're common. They market rewards free cash flow generation. And these companies never generated cash flow, period. They just kind of drilled and destroyed returns. And now that hasn't happened. And the market's been rewarding that. And so I don't know how quickly management teams kind of want to go back to kind of the old experience. And, and I think the incentive structures have changed, too. Um, as well, where it's not drill for the sake of drilling. This is now an industry where a lot of the management teams we're, we're speaking to are focused on return. And that's the way to think about it. And they're generating great returns here. Um, so we like energy overall. And the ESG component, I would say, um, you know, we have an analyst here who's done it a long time. He's helped us through uh, many different cycles here. And, and we have an engagement process um, with, with all these companies, right? And we just have a call today. I won't name the company with with um, with their CEO and the board, which is really nice to see as a bond investor to get that kind of access. And 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 a lot of these companies have added ESG board members. They have policies in place now, and it's really nice to see. By no means am I going to suggest this is a dirty industry, right? Like there's ways they can clean up, right? The methane and such, you know, some of the the processes that are, you know, I think that were kind of the old processes now be newer processes that are cleaner. Um, and maybe they'll down the road, there'll be carbon capture and such, but you're still investing in a dirty industry. But I think you want to engage these companies, at least help them on their journey, you know, through kind of what the market's expecting, you know, as an investment. And I think the ones you would want to own, I think it would ESG, the way we think about it would be, you know, companies that are improving their sustainalytics or MSCI score or, you know, what, however you're internally measuring it. And those will be the companies that are rewarded, right? And so that's kind of a nice mix where you get the commodity right. And then you have, you know, kind of a little bit, a little bit of improvement on the ESG side. Then there's the story of gas, right, which is an interesting one because that's a transition fuel, and a, and I think a necessary fuel, you know, for backup generation, you know, for wind and solar, that's a, that's variable, wind more than solar, and you've seen the rally in the gas markets, right, and and certainly that's I think being driven by by Europe, um, just like our rate market is, but I think the gas market certainly being driven by Europe, and that's a cleaner fuel. Um, and I think that's something that is more of a secular story versus oil, which may be declining over time. But I think we all know declining businesses could be really great investments, right? Tobacco is a good example, right? And that's not to say that we don't care about ESG. We absolutely do. Um, but, but, you know, from an investment standpoint, I think, you know, you have to kind of take all these things into consideration when, when, um, when picking, you know, a sector or bonds. And Stephen, I wanted to follow up a little bit on the crude producers, if we, if we can. Um, you know, the shift from production focus to more shareholder value focuses has definitely been felt and, and seen in some of the performance there. Uh, also, the pressure from the ESG, you know, perhaps shifting some, some capital away from investing in capital expenditures of, of oil producers. Um, and we've seen that in the rig counts. The, the, the producers thus far have been slow to, to ramp up production post-pandemic, even on the back of this 
this rise in one of the C's that you're talking about, crude oil within the commodity complex. But you know, now that we're at around eighty dollars a barrel, when do you do you expect or are you hearing chatter? I suppose of uh, producers looking to to bring back uh, the pace of which they you know they get the rigs fired up again. And if the so, answer is, what do you think that does to the oil? I mean, do you think we ever get to that hundred dollar point again, or are we going to be are we kind of near the 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 tipping point where you start to see some demand destruction because of the price? Sure. So I would say the answer to the first question is is not yet, but stay tuned because I think this earnings season is going to be really telling, right? Um, sure, they'll report fantastic numbers, but we're going to I think investors will challenge them on that question, and we'll see. You know, kind of this is the time where you'll see what the guidance is for production. So far, it's been very, very restrained up until, you know, kind of our last conversations with management teams, but we'll see what they say during the quarter. Um, I still think, you know, the U.S. has a, a really great resource um, that's been good for the United States, right? Um, that we're no longer importing oil, right? And we have our own, um, you know, asset here that it's very prolific. Um, and so I, I do think that um, if I'm wrong on this, right, there, there will be plenty of, of of wells that can be drilled profitably at, at these price points and that will come online. Um, and that would, I would mean, and all else equal, right? I mean, oh, it's a global commodity, but all else equal, that would lower the price um, if you have too much supply, obviously. OPEC has been another big one, right? And OPEC, that the market a couple of weeks ago was expecting a change. Um, they haven't changed um, yet um, and they don't seem like they're willing uh, to move production higher, which is nice to see. So then it goes back to kind of, you know, what your expectations are for the demand side, right? And so far that's been very, very strong. And then the variant, you know, there could be a variant here where, um, you know, that can that can change that narrative quickly, right? Um, but not my base case. So, um, you know, from my, my perspective, I, I don't want to see a hundred dollar oil because <laughs> I think a hundred dollar oil, um, while not as negative as it would be for economies, let's say 20 years ago, given kind of the shifts that have been, that have been made, it still is a negative, I think, for the market. But at this price, uh, these companies we're investing in are doing quite well, and we're modeling them at 55, right? And they're doing quite well, um, and so and so that's kind of how we're you know how we're thinking about it. But but I, I I'm not as I said earlier, I'm not completely can maybe I'm just a scarred high yield guy. I'm not completely convinced that rate counts won't go up and they won't drill at 90 dollar oil. I'm just not completely convinced. It's still an unconsolidated industry. I think people respond to that incentive. It's just too tempting. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree with that. So we, we've ran through the gamut of the kind of inflationary risk. You think that's kind of an above average kind of growth environment. And I'll, I'll paint that above average just relative to, you know, the post GFC pre pandemic trend. Yep. Um, you know, what, what are some of the risks that you guys have been discussing at Lord Abbott that, you know, we haven't touched upon. Everybody's talking about inflation. We've seen the Google trend search. It's off the charts again. Um, it's it's now creeping into every single earnings uh, report out there. It seems like. What are some of the risks that you guys are thinking about that you know aren't as like, either popular or well known today? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, every day my colleagues throw something. Most of are operating in chats. They throw out these risks. Um, you know, Taiwan just came up as as one. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. Which may not be as popular, um, but certainly I think. Uh, something to consider. Um, you know, we haven't talked about China, which is probably more popular um, and hard to figure out, right? Um, obviously, the property sector is uh, experiencing a mass experiencing a massive deleveraging, which has not been a a macro story, but certainly been a, a story in China, right? And that's been the one bear market we've seen this year. If you look at the Hang Seng, right, that you know that's down over 20, 25 percent, and and we haven't talked about you know common prosperity and what that's done for tech stocks there and. Um, that's been the kind of the bear market, but certainly a slowing China, um, and it is slowing, but maybe price now, right? You saw the data that came out last night. I think everyone kind of expected a slowdown, um, and the market didn't react all that much. So, but that's something always to consider, given how. Yeah, one of the, the lower GDP prints. It's one one of the lower GDP prints. It's one of the lower ones. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. think, and I don't know. I think you know, Goldman came out last week and and said maybe last this weekend. I can't keep track of days, but where they didn't expect a reserve cut, um, and I don't know if the market was expecting that. Um, and so far, the Chinese government's kind of slow played the property market here, right? They're no, they don't seem to be moving with a lot of urgency. Um, but I do think they they certainly care about their onshore markets. I don't know about the offshore market. <laughs> That's being yeah. like, yeah. so so there's that. Um, but usually in this business, right? Like I remember, you know, kind of leading up to the pandemic, everyone's asking me what can turn this around. No one said pandemic. <laughs> you know, it's always something that we we you know we we don't know, right? I think. 
one of the things I think, um, you know, I don't know if it's, po- you know, I think it's more of a positive, but it depends how your position, right, is maybe we're, we're past kind of these supply chain. You mentioned how inflation is kind of all over Google search and supply chains on cover of Barron's. And, and I mentioned earlier in the Wall Street Journal saying economists think, you know, it won't get resolved to Q2 22. What if it gets resolved earlier, right? And kind of, you know, maybe that kind of fear of, of this, you know, kind of you know, extended inflationary kind of environment kind of dissipates away while we wait for the other components to, to move higher, which are sl- a slower moving series, right? OER and wages. And I think that, you know, that's ultimately bullish, right? Um, it may not be as bullish for some of the cyclicality, right? It may be more bullish for tech stocks and kind of quality spread, but that's something that, given how we're positioned, you want to think about, right? If you're too long kind of cyclicality, yep. that's something that, that you want to consider. And I think reasonable, actually, to consider yeah. that at this point. So let me, let me spin it the other way around, uh, as <laughs> Sam calls the other way around, bro. Um, let's, what are the positives? Well, what do you like right now? Where do you think investors are under allocated and what would be your little pitch to them right now to tell them this is the asset you need, or you need more of this in your portfolio today? Yeah, well, that's a tough question to answer because usually in the way we make our money, especially in this environment is what we don't own, right? It's what we don't own in a negatively convex environment. I'd say just a couple of things we haven't talked about. One is, um, we do like parts of commercial real estate. Um, so in the CMBS market, you know, you look at that single asset, single borrower, and that's a case by case basis. I think earlier on kind of, you know, um, earlier in the year, it was very much centered around hotels and, and reopening. And I think there's still some opportunities there. Industrial is a good secular story that may be fully priced. And then for us, it's kind of multifamily and then figuring out the office side of the equation, um, which yeah. is a case by case basis. Yeah, we were going through some deals today and uh, they were talking about, you know, uh, our CRE team was talking about this too, about the discrepancy between like industrial pricing and, you know, an, an office space deal. And, and these were, I believe they were conduits, not SASB that you refer to. And just the gaping difference in yields, like triple A's were like 75 to 85 in the industrial sector. But you know, they were talking like 120 to 130, you know, when you got to office space, then as you go down the capital stack, you know, you were talking about like 200 basis point discrepancy for like the triple B. So definitely a, a tale of two worlds within CRE. Yeah, and, and definitely not an efficient market and securitize and, and I think worth getting your hands dirty, right? And yeah. by no means I want to proclaim that all offices are coming back, right? But there will be some that do. Yeah. And uh, you kind of want to figure that out. And that's what our team is doing. Um, I think you know, I mentioned COOs, you know, COOs, if you look at, uh, you know, double A, single A COOs, I mean, even the triple A's look great in this environment to get a, you know, 110 yeah. a spread on a triple A, you know, double A's, I think around 170. There's been a lot of supply there, as we know. Um, I would think it's getting absorbed quite nicely now. And I think that's a nice place to hide. You know, it'd be clearly, you know, much upside, but you do have nice carry. And, uh, and it depends how aggressive you want to be. Like even some of the double B's now at 650 look interesting to us. You could find the right managers. I think that's a nice area. Um, so two letter C things there, CRE and CLS. Um, you know, commodities, I, I've we've been bullish on. I, I'd say um, I'm not as bullish given the run we've had at this moment in time. Um, but but certainly things that benefit from that, that kind of trending inflation that we talked about. And I think it's yeah. more of a case by case basis. The aluminum is a better secular story. We talked about oil. Uranium looks like the break. And then this uranium is something you really can't invest in the credit markets, but it's more of a case by case basis. Yeah, it's been very popular in the ETF front. I know that too. It has, it's lot, lots, has of, yes. lots of money going into that. Um, so um, this has been very interesting. I, I hope our listeners enjoy this too. But Stephen, can you tell our listeners where they can get more access to information about what you do, uh, about your firm? What's the best ways, best place for people to get inside the mind of Stephen Rocco? Well, we um, we do have our website. I would say lordabbott.com. Um, is probably the best place to start. Um, I believe we do have a Twitter account that I follow. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much we post on there, but uh, we do have a Twitter account. Um, so we are on social media, but I think lordabbott.com is a lot of great content that I, that I and uh, LinkedIn as well. Um, I notice all the content kind of populating through my, my LinkedIn feed if you can't find it on lordabbott.com. Okay, great. And uh, for those of you that are uh, looking for access to there, we'll, we'll post that too on, on our Twitter. Uh, Sam's uh, very active in that, posting all kinds of charts and stuff for us too. So, Stephen, this has been a pleasure. You know, I always like nerding out in the bond world, uh, having a great conversation here. But before we let you leave, there's we got to introduce you to Sam's favorite part of the show. So, Sam, Stephen, my favorite part of the show is called Sherman Says. It's where I will offer a series of alternating prompts 
between you and Sherman, to which I hope to get a quick top of mind response from you. Um, and I'm gonna alternate between the two of you with unique prompts to each. I'm gonna give it off to Sherman first so he can uh, give you a little, a little example here. Inflation, second wave. Uh, the impulse is down. Uh, so what I mean by that is that I think, uh, as Steven said earlier, I think inflation remains elevated to pre-pandemic levels, but it subsides from these levels. So I think we're moving to a world where it's like a three to 4% inflation rate for the next, let's call it 18 to 24 months. So that's what I mean by that second wave, uh, unlike right. the Delta. Yeah. All right. Over to you, Stephen, with rate hikes abroad, central bank rate hikes abroad. I think um, you started to see few, right? Like New Zealand raised. I mean, abroad is such a <laughs> such a yes. you know, big world, right? So um, I, I think uh, what you'll see here to answer this question will be a more aggressive Fed and a less aggressive ECB. All right. Yeah, I, I, I want to point out the data point we heard uh, last week at one of our investor meetings, too, that the everybody expected the central bank in Chile to hike rates. Right. And then they surprised with an additional hike. And to those that, that think a 25 basis point hike is crazy, the, the expectation was for 125 and they hiked 150. You know, yeah. so that, that's always crazy to me to hear that. You know, it would take us a year and a half at, at kind of the expectations for us to get to that 150 aggregate hike, right? So I will say this: Turkey will cut no matter what the inflation rate is. So I don't know <laughs> if I'm I don't know if I'm violating the rules of this game, but that that will be true. So yeah, well, when you're in in high teens, <laughs> it's tough, right? It's tough to hike yes. still. Anyway, yeah, yeah. It seems like a lot of the younger analysts have gotten this quarter point hike ingrained in their minds as well from the Fed that they only hike in or cut in quarter point increments. But I guess. Uh, Last year in March, it kind of changed their view on that when we <laughs> dropped rates by what a point or more yeah, uh, yeah. in consecutive days. So, all right, back to the Sherman says with Sherman's prompt, international travel restrictions. They got released. Yeah, bring bring on the foreigners. Come come to America, come spend money and make our economy great. We're, we're yeah, open for yeah. business. Yeah, wave it in. All right, back to you, Stephen, with, let's see here, investing gamification. Robinhood, I think uh, retail investing has been good uh, for the market. It's a good way for people to learn. Um, and I'm happy to see it, to be honest. It doesn't bother me all that much. And uh, where we've uh, actually seen impacts in the high yield market, right? A lot of those companies like AMC are high yield companies and we're able to raise equity off the back of, of, uh, of the retail money. So I think it's good to have younger investors in the market. All right. Back to Sherman with natural gas. What a ride, what a ride. You know, uh, I remember when uh, the forecasts for nat gas were negative, right? The, you know, it's gonna trade to negative uh, dollars per BTU, which prior to last year, I never thought commodities really would trade to a negative nominal dollar <laughs> price. Uh, but, um, you know, we've seen it. And as Stephen pointed out, the Euro's European markets up over 300%. I mean, it's been noisy as can be. Um, remember, if, uh, if you haven't studied your history on natural gas, uh, I encourage people to, to follow the story of Amaranth. Um, and there's a trader out there, won't name his name, but uh, one of the classic stories. So the Widowmaker trade is named that for a reason and be careful uh, trading natural gas to the, to the young uninitiated. Strap in. When, when hopefully TXU isn't get LBO again either. That was kind of the peak of the last gas cycle. <laughs> that was that was the last one, right? So, yeah, that was uh, like 07. Yeah, the parts of TXU that exist. If that happens again, we know what to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm giving this one back to you, Stephen, with uh, cola cost of living adjustment. Um, higher, <laughs> I'd say. Um, um, you know, I think one of the things, and I was just talking to my wife about this, right, that she keeps saying, how can you say there's no inflation when there's all these things that we're spending money on that are higher in price? Um, and so uh, and so, it's interesting. We talked about OER and other measures of CPI, but, um, you know, the reality is there's, you know, the cost of living are going, are unfortunately going up. Yeah, now this is on the back, that prompt on the, on the back of the Social Security announcing the 5.9% the uh, 
adjustment for for 2020 that's going to take place in 2022 it's amazing that's the one one term of finance that my mom knows she told me about that she was so stoked for her 5.9 percent raise and then she goes i bet my prescriptions go up by six and a half percent though that's right <laughs> that's probably true more than that yeah yeah it's a bad sign actually you know when those things move up that much uh, let's see, I'm passing it back to you, Stephen, with, uh, or, or to you, Sherman, sorry, Port of Los Angeles. 24-7. All right. And then uh, U.S. sovereign debt default. That one's to you, Stephen. No way. Los Angeles Dodgers. 0-2. Do oh They're going down. You know, go, go Braves. I, I, I like the Braves. I like the Braves, you know, here, so. We'll see, uh, it's tough to lose two ninth inning games back to back. That's demoralizing. But they go to that raucous, raucous crowd in LA where Atlanta struggled. So it's going to be make or break in the next couple of games. I thought you were going to say you just can't root for Guggenheim, Jeff. But all yeah. right, nah, I'm okay with that. I just can't root for the Dodgers. Just can't root for the Dodgers, you know. Right. And it was heartbreaking. So I'll complain about the call like everybody else, but I'm not going to complain about the check swing strike to, to end the giant season. I'm going to complain about the batter before because the hottest hitter on the team takes a pitch that's up and out and like they bring him up on strike three. I just think the game was bad there. But, um, you know, look, if there's a human element, it happens and that's part of the game. So anyway, I'll take it. I eat the crow. I forecast the Giants win. I lost. Move on. Yeah, it was a painful way to, to to close it out. It was just ugly. It was just ugly. So, um, but got, like, kudos to the Dodgers that they they were the better team. Yeah. All right, and then the final one to wrap up the show here is to you, Stephen. Holiday shopping season. Very strong, very strong. Can't wait to go out and buy. Hopefully, the supply chain issues are not there, um, and there's things to buy. But I think there's reasons to celebrate this year. As uh, hopefully, are moving to the tail end of the pandemic. Hey, I love the positivity. That is the way to end the Sherman show. Let's keep it on a high note. Everyone go out there and support Steven's uh, thesis here. Go out, spend some money, enjoy it. You know, you've worked hard. Um, save some money as well. Do some investing. Steven Rocco, thank you for joining us here on today's Sherman show. It was a pleasure. Uh, again, for those of you that don't know Steven, he's the co-head of Taxable Fixed Income over at Lord Abbott, responsible in overseeing all of the high yield and uh, and the uh, multi-strategy uh, fixed income opportunities over there. Steven, it's been a pleasure. Thanks again. Thank you, Jeff and Sam. I loved it. Thank you. And if you want to see Steven up close and personal, you can catch us on the YouTube channel, youtube.com backslash double line capital. Uh, remember Sam's moonlighting on another podcast. He's been cheating on me all year uh, with Jeff Mayberry on the double line Monday morning minutes. Uh, they drop that every uh, Monday morning before the bells record on Friday to give you a macro update. And as always on The Sherman Show, we try to bring a uh, very exclusive guests like Stephen to bring the insights to financial markets. So catch us on the Twitter at Sherman Show Pod, uh, and we'll be talking at you soon in the next couple of weeks. Take care, everybody, and speak then.